produced by Ranting Rhino Productions. Praxis Pedagogy exists to position our teaching and learning practice within different methodologies. We want to construct a guild of educators dedicated to designing a difference in our own teaching and learning and in our students' experience. Thanks again for taking the time to tune in and listen to this episode number 67 with Sally, Lucy, and myself as we sit down and talk about chapter three in the very influential book, Appreciative Inquiry in Higher Education. The chapter is called Hope and Magic. This episode is entitled Mindset of Hope, and we spend a lot of time talking about the power, influence, and lasting effects of bringing hope with you into almost every situation. Sit back, relax, enjoy, go for a walk, enjoy, do whatever you need to do. This is a great episode. We had a lot of fun doing this and uh, we got deep into this chapter. And so we really hope that you appreciate it. We'll see you on the other side. One. Hey everybody, welcome back to Praxis Pedagogy Podcast. In this special series, this is good because we're doing Appreciative Inquiry in Higher Education by Jeannie Cockle and Joan MacArthur Blair. We are in Chapter 3, The Passions of Your Practice. And uh, it's a, it's a, it's a good, good chapter. I like it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, hooks me. Yeah, no. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it hooks me too. Speechless. I speak more well, now going into it. It was like, uh, I don't know, like the magic mm. and the hope and, um, you know, dark times right now and stuff. But, um, but yeah, I really, I really enjoyed this chapter. I'm looking forward to, uh, to heading into it. And I know we were going to, you know, may, maybe concentrate on, you know, hope, but I hope we can share a, a slice of the magic. Mm-hmm. Well, of course we can. I, I, yeah. I, I kept, I kept thinking to myself, what word can I use other than magic wand when I'm in a room Tim, full of trades you instructors? You and me, yes, too, yes. And I can't wait until we get further in when we come up with that question because I have been thinking yeah. about that all day. Yeah. What other word can we use? But before we go any further, I have to say, mm. um, this poem written by Joe MacArthur Blair on the mm-hmm. first page. Mm-hmm. Now, maybe Tim, you can add this to the show notes, but for you know, those of you that are listening right now, um, Joan talks about driving along and seeing somebody that's hitchhiking and they have a sign say, I'm going, no, where were you really going? What does it say? I saw you standing by the road, you held up a sign that said, I'm going wherever you are. And she talks through all of what's going through her mind. Maybe that person's a Zen master, but she drives on by them. She wonders, um, you know, if they wanted to talk, Um, you know, she has all these thoughts going through her mind. And then she turns around to pick this person up. And she says, you ran to my car already laughing and I took you where I was going. Anyway, as I read this, whether it's a metaphor for Joan's thinking or whether this really Mm -hmm. happened is to me, it really captured the trust and the hope that is embedded in appreciative inquiry. Mm -hmm. So I just absolutely loved it that this is, it's such a lived, a lived belief that I hear in her words. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that came across yeah. loud and clear in the whole chapter and right at, and not to not to give it away, but I'm going to give it away. But at the, at the last <laughs> the last page of the of the chapter, they, they outline kind of kind of what I feel about the whole idea of appreciative inquiry, especially when it when we're applying it into a, a, a TVET concept. And she says it's both a philosophy and a practice. Mm-hmm. Right. And for those in higher education, we wrap our arms around it from the perspective of our own areas of study, research, writing, and interest. And, and I love the freedom that comes with that. We're they're, you know, they're not saying, Hey, listen, you got to do it this way and you got to do it that way, or else it doesn't work at all. And if you don't follow our methodology, it's, it, it'll, it'll produce little to no results. Right. I, I so I appreciate mm-hmm. the freedom that, that comes in that. 
because I think every context that we, that we move into uh, is the, the practice of it is going to look a little different. The philosophy won't change, but the application or the practice of it will morph a little bit and evolve depending on the context of the room. Don't you think? Mm -hmm. And the philosophy, I think the fact that they actually speak to, you know, the philosophy of um, appreciative inquiry is what separates it for me from many of the change management books that I've you know, leadership mm -hmm. um, centered books that I've read over the years, which are very procedural, like the procedurals can't procedures come first and maybe the values and beliefs are hovering there in the background. But this is very much these are our values and our beliefs. And this is how we live those in our role of, you know, this transformative change, really, that they, mm -hmm. you know, they hope will will happen mm -hmm. yeah and that, and that's and exactly I, why transformational leadership is so powerful is because it taps into the value systems of people and you're because mm -hmm. you're connecting the values of people to the to the vision and the mission statement of the organization and that's mm -hmm. why when we hear people say that they'll leave one organization to go to another because it the, the value system of that second organization resonates with them that's what they're talking about mm -hmm. and and i think it, it's incumbent upon us when we begin practicing or continue practicing in our ai um that that we were, were really mindful of that and that's why i really think it, it it it's important for me when i go into a into a space to listen as much as i can at the beginning right to try and tease out those value systems to find out where the connections are mm -hmm. uh between the crowd and and where we want to go mm -hmm. i think i think now like i you know for me personally i'm i'm getting better at doing that um i feel that I don't know whether it's coming from trades or being a young educator. Like, you know, I, I was, uh, I, I started in my trade when I was not even, I think I just turned 16. And so like, by the time I was 25 and teaching, I'd already like put away like nine years within the trade. But to, when I came into Canada, it was very, very young. And, and so, you know, when you come in, you do have all of this, like, you know, joy and passion and love and hope. And you just have this abundance of energy and, um, and people, you know, don't, don't generally like that abundance of energy that's there. So when, when I've gone into a room before and you kind of feel like, well, I have to prove, like, I don't know where it stems from. I don't know if it stems from, you know, being, um, you know, being from trades and being in a room of academics. I don't know if it stems from being, you know, generally a woman, being someone that has the wanting to be listened, being a middle child. Like, I don't know what it is, <laughs> but like, I feel now, <laughs> I feel now that I have, you know, the confidence to, um, to say it's okay for you to go into a meeting and not always having to be, you know, the person leading that conversation. It's, um, you know, it's okay if people feel that you didn't contribute because you listened. Cause I always felt like, well, they've invited me to this meeting for a reason. And if I don't speak up and contribute, then they're going to believe that they're going to think that maybe I'm not a valued member of the team. Mm -hmm. And, right. um, and I've learned from people that I work with, even just recently, like people that I work with now within my team, you know, that the, the amount of, um, uh, the amount of abundance that comes from just sitting back and hearing and f feeling the vibes and and tuning on on those things rather than being the main speaker mm -hmm. you know and i yeah. and i think yeah. that what you're you know cap really capturing there lucy is the environment that you know the authors really speak about mm -hmm. creating that environment and what comes to mind for me there is that it's done in a way not only you know, because I think with my trades background as well, it really resonates with me what you're saying. You feel like you have to prove yourself. And and I, too, have sat in academic circles and and felt that I have to that I have to, you know, make my, you know, my place in that environment. And um, and so I, I know that feeling. But as I think about that and you talk about the value of, you know, sitting back and really listening, that is a gift as well for the people mm -hmm. that are in the room. And I think that's what I get from the authors that in their 
safe environment that they really work towards creating is that there's space for you to listen and there's space for you to be heard, which, you know, brings that all full circle to what Tim started with as well by Mm -hmm. saying, you know, I think we're all in facilitation roles and, Um, And maybe early on when any of us started facilitating, it was very easy to think that our role was to go in and 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 tell people what we were going to do and, and, you know, lead from the front as such. Mm -hmm. And now we understand that so differently. And I think that the authors do a really good job of spending so much time talking about creating that space exactly mm-hmm. for the, the the listening and and sharing of values yeah I mean how can you appreciate inquiry if you don't take the time to listen to what's happening you know there you know, there needs to be that, room that's for that. a there, tweetable we, quote right there there we go yeah mm-hmm. Just speaking of tweetable quotes I, you know going into this book there were so many areas that I was like highlighting I was like I love this line <laughs> I love this line. I need to remind myself of this line. And, you know, um, even when I first went into the chapter, um, you know, how it talks about the, you know, the reason why we are doing what we're doing right now. And I think sometimes we need to kind of, you know, remember that, like, why did we begin, um, you know, maybe in the trade or why did we begin teaching the trade or what did it feel like when we were given off first contract at at a college and we could now stand in front of a class and you know and the amount of energy that we put into it and I I feel that um you know there is there is time when we need to appreciate you know kind of the the synergy the work that we're creating the team and that we're working and if all of a sudden that's not there anymore then we really have to have some deep thought into Mm -hmm. why we are you know doing this and um and that's why like you know I like the slice of magic because you know, uh, you know, we've walked in, I, I, I took some notes down and then I, it, it triggered to me that I've give, given a lot of tours in the area of trades before when people have come into the college and there's sweet spots in the departments. And I say it often, I'm like, see over here, this is where magic happens right here. <laughs> this, is, this is where it takes place. And, and, uh, and so I was giggling to myself as I was highlighting through because I was like, you know, magic is transformation. And, you know, there are certain places like, you know, it went back in, you know, in my previous job in, in, in the hair stylist and the skin and body therapy department, we had this very, we have this very small, um, staff room and, um, it's where the magic happens. It's where, it's where the grit takes place. It's where ideas flow. It's where people connect and then they go out and they do their stuff and they go to their classes and they're on their own and then they come back. And, you know, and they work through things and I just, um, and I just found like, oh my God, it's so funny because when I ever, whenever I do tours, I always notice the places in which I feel the magic happens. And that's generally where everyone can meet and collaborate and then go off and do their thing. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, uh, yeah, so that's, and, uh, and uh, it's interesting taking a step back from that is that, you know, when they start to talk about where the magic happens, they also, you know, prior to that, and I guess the two authors have a slightly different take on this, but Mm -hmm. um, Joe MacArthur Blair talks about the ability to hope and how that is a, you know, culture, a culture it can be. And I think this is very much sort of, you can look at it at the micro level, macro level within the institution. Each institution has its own culture. But we know within departments and within splits in departments that there's, mm-hmm. you know, they are allowed to hope in one group and not so much in the other. But as I was thinking about this, I was actually thinking of culture as in, you know, even like the culture of mm-hmm. BC or or the Vancouver Island, Lower Mainland. And I think that that we do actually live in a culture where we have that ability to hope. Even throughout this pandemic, I think people have, you know, openly come forward with positive things that have come, the opportunities that have come mm-hmm. forward to them. So it, it, to me, when I reflect on that, I think, okay, we we do live or or the way I perceive it in this, this with the ability to hope. And then what for me, for me, what I took about that away from that is that 
if you lived in an environment or a culture where hope was not embedded in your belief structure, for example, it seems to me that that it's a gift that you know every child should have. And, and, and it's not a, you know, it's not just like a one-time give, it's got to be experienced in every aspect of their life. And, and they talk about that hope is that sort of grain in there that through hope you build resilience. And I think about all of those programs right now around building resilience, but I don't think it's an add-on and I don't think hope is an add-on. Mm-hmm. So this is kind of where I'm going with it, that in every aspect of what we do, being able to take that lens of appreciating even the tiniest, tiniest, minutest ray of hope in there. And, and they talk about that, that, you know, hope causes that shift. But if you don't see it, I think then it would be really difficult to work with any group, even in the collaboration, Lucy. So like you're talking about where the magic happens and it gives me a sense that there's always hope when those people come together, even in, you know, turbulent well, times. You know, magic isn't always good magic. <laughs> you <laughs> yes, know, it's but- not always happy rainbow magic with sparkles and, and uh, all the good stuff. I mean, magic can be dark too. And uh, and so, you know, when w- what you were just alluding to, um, you know, with, with Joan's journey of hope and, you know, she talked about the storm has rearranged the educational beach and, you know, and, and how, you know, a storm can come in and it can be rocky and it can be, you know, and then, but she knows the sand will come back and it will be different, but it's not necessarily going to be a bad thing. And, and, um, and, you know, like I, I think about some of the experiences, you know, that I've been through as a leader or, you know, become, become working in our institution and, and, you know, the magic and the hope it's, well, the magic, first of all, as we said, it's not always a good thing. And that the hope is, um, yeah, you have to have some hope or else what's the point in doing any type of facilitating or appreciative, you know, that's what appreciative inquiry is. It's, it's, you, you have, a, you sometimes have a really bad situation. And you have to start to bring together some ideas on how can this situation transform into something that was better than what it was when we went into this discussion. And, um, and you know, this is, this is a, a practice that you have to, it has to be part of you and your culture. If you are always going to be like, well, no, like we, we don't want to, and it's, it's like that the pivot now, like it's like what we went through. If you don't see the value in what we've just been through, find the hope in what we've just been through and use the good stuff and make come out of this experience way better than what we went into it. Education wise, trades wise, you know, delivering our, delivering the the type of work that we deliver. And then you really need to evaluate whether you're in the right seat and what seat that you should be in. Because, um, because I think that, you know, as an educator, as someone who believes, who's passionate about education, especially trades education, you need to find um, that that tiny bit of magic and that tiny bit of hope that thought, wow, like we can actually do this. Like, we could actually do something evolutionary that we never thought that we could do in trades education. And I think if you don't have a slice of that kind of hope or that I spark of idea, and maybe that's what the magic is, is that that spark of idea those electricians listening in, <laughs> you know, that <laughs> light bulb moment, you know, then, um, you know, then, then there's no possible way that we can ever, you know, make trades, you know, or continue to make trades, you know, better than it, than it could have yeah. ever been, you know, and, and look forward to those, look forward to the type of education that we can be li- delivering in yeah. 10, 20, 50 years time. Yeah. And I think, you know, you mentioned the pivot there and just, you know, us three here and I, and anybody that's been listening since the pivot in March 2020 will have heard lots of their conversations and, and you know, thinking about Chad Flynn, that, who's been with us for lots of these conversations too. The hope has been there all the way through for us. You know, from the beginning, we talked about opportunity And I think what you're saying, you know, Lucy, this is a quality that really is, 
necessary. And, and, and as much as I see it being a quality that's necessary, the thing that I really like about this book is that is it, you know, it's a learned behavior. I believe that hope is a learned behavior. And so to me, the piece of this that I love is that hopefully by the end of this book, or maybe when I've taken the course to become a facilitator here, is that I would be able to work with others and create the climate where that I enabled them maybe for their first time to actually begin to see that that light, begin to see mm-hmm. the hope. And, and through that, through that practice, build that resilience so that when the storm comes in again and the rocks and everything are blown around on the beach, that they are able to trust that there will be, there's going to be hopeful out there. So I think that's the piece for me that if I was surrounded by, you know, some of the scenarios that they share in here, surrounded in that very safe environment that I could be, even if I hadn't been in that, I didn't have that lens before, I think I could begin to practice it. And, and I get the sense that, that the practice of it would then shed into all aspects of my life. I, I don't think that yeah. you can turn it on and off. No, You're going to, once it becomes your practice, then it's going to benefit everything that you do. Yeah. Mr. Carson. Yeah. We no, know like that. that. And, <laughs> and before, before, before Tim like goes into this, there was the, it, it all works over this. But um, you know, uh, Joan mentions that hope is a state of mind. So what you're talking about right now, I mean, that's um, like how can you how can you lead um, or how can you lead or facilitate or coach if you don't have that if you don't have that kind of natural philosophy or maybe or learned or maybe experienced, then it's put you in this, in this way of thinking now, you know, it, it can be through learned experiences. Um, it's not something that some, you know, that's, you know, constitutional to you or, you know, and, and so, uh, so yeah, so that's, you know, hope is, hope is a state of mind and it seeks to understand people and their past in a way is not necessarily focused you know on the event or the outcome mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and uh yeah so I actually highlighted that in pink because I <laughs> rather and, than my usual yellow but yeah um, and also knowing that you know in their facilitation roles those that haven't had that you know that mindset before that this practice really is and that brings me back to that is, you know, hope is a gift that everyone should receive, like to learn to practice it, I think is now for me, I think about um, some of the different groups that we facilitate and some of the challenges that, you know, those, um, you know, working in situations where people aren't enthusiastic, they're, you know, then they've obviously had experiences that have left them feeling in other mm-hmm. ways. But for me, this feels like a very powerful toolkit that can be utilized in, in many. Well, I think not just utilized, I believe if it's a lived belief, then that is going to spread through all of the people that you work with as well. Some yeah. slower than others. Yeah. Timothy, we're waiting. We oh, know. Wow. We, we <laughs> know. I know. We we're Don't both do that. Yes. Don't do that. Yeah. Thing. Yeah. I know. We know he's yeah. been waiting. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We we want it. We want to hear your uh, your <laughs> you absorbed what we've just kind of <laughs> chatted on about, and now tell us what your magic wand is. Come on, we know you're dying to. Well. To, uh, <laughs> so I'm um, listen, listen, listening to the conversation. Hope is definitely a mindset. And we often, we often run into the terms, you know, fixed mindset or growth mindset versus a static mindset or, um, you know, a stagnant mindset. I I think, I think hope is, well, I don't think, I know hope is a mindset. And before, before we get down into a, into a hole about that, where people will start thinking, well, if it's not my mindset, then I can't have it. 
I don't think, I don't think that's absolutely, absolutely true because I think we can change our mindset. Sometimes it takes a crisis to change the mindset. Sometimes it's just a steady walk, uh, through the park and one step at a time. And we do it. I like the definition that, uh, is listed for us about hope where, um, she says, for me, hope is the ability to recognize the reality of what is and find within that reality a possible path emerging from the attention paid to the smallest of details. And so there's, if I unpack that a tiny bit, uh, one hope is that ability to recognize the reality. And what we've talked about this before, where AI is not a, it's not a philosophy, it's not a practice that seeks to ignore the reality that we're embedded in. Mm -hmm. Right. Like we're not candy coating. We're not frosting over what's going on and going, okay, everybody grab onto your unicorns. Cause we're going to ride over the golden mm -hmm. rainbow. Um, cause that never works, right? It doesn't matter what industry you're in. That never works. Uh, especially when you're dealing with realists, AKA pessimists. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> cause I've, I've run into people who say, I'm, I'm not a pessimist. I'm just a realist. And, and if I'm proven right, then I'm right. And if I'm proven wrong, then I'm still happy. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, and, and I, I totally appreciate that perspective. What, so I like this idea of recognizing the reality of what you're situated in. Uh, and that's going to change based on the context that you're in and, and, and the like, and, and that will change from department to department. It may even change from faculty member to faculty member. Uh, and it will definitely change institution to institution uh, and it will definitely change province to province, nation to nation. But the great thing about, the definition is, is that it goes on to talk about finding within that reality, a possible path. And, and I really yeah. appreciate that because it doesn't say to find in the reality, the path, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. It's a possible path. And so mm -hmm. it, if for me, that means I'm holding, I'm holding the outcome of what uh, you mentioned earlier, Lucy, I'm holding the outcome loosely. Uh, and I think some of us, especially us, a type driven, get it done kind of people what will, are willing to walk into a situation as long as we walk out knowing what we're going to do and how to fix it. <laughs> and sometimes AI doesn't, doesn't allow us to do that. Right. No. And, and coming to embrace that I think is, is really powerful. So there's the ability to recognize the reality, find uh, within that reality, find a possible path emerging from attention paid to the smallest of details. And that's, that's the be quiet and listen. Like you have two ears in one mouth, uh, ask a question and just let people go. And eventually you will get your question answered. And sometimes you have to ask that question again and again, just, so why are we here? Like you mentioned earlier, Lucy, like mm -hmm. why, why, why do you do what you do? Right. Mm -hmm. what, what value is this in it for you? And peel back those layers and eventually you'll, you'll get to the value. So I, I love that piece. The other thing I, I, that came to mind as you were talking is that for me, um, I'm a very hopeful person in the sense that I'm, I'm always looking for not the ray of sunshine or the silver lining, but I'm, I'm, I'm deeply convinced that things can always get better. Right. Um, and I mean, obviously things can get way better given the last year that we've had, but, you know, I'm thinking back even a couple of years ago where things were going pretty good. You know, we, we had it, we had somewhat of a stable environment. We had uh, meaning educationally speaking, we had a somewhat stabilized, you know, government mandate, which was, you know, good enough to go on. Budgets were stabilized. There wasn't any big crisis that way. And, and, you know, wait lists were growing and we're hiring, we're hiring instructors and everything's going tickety boo. But, you know, there's something in the back of my head saying, but what can we do better? What can we tweak that can, that can make this even better? And I'm not just talking about the program. Uh, of course, that's important, but I'm also thinking about faculty. How can faculty get just a little bit better? Um, and so for me, hope, hope for me is, is like a match, but my match never goes out. All right. So you can't blow it out. Um, and, and it can't be stomped out. Then people have tried and it just, it just never goes out. Um, and, and I'm convinced that if I bring my match to somebody else who has a match, then that light gets brighter. And so there's, there's not only camaraderie in that, but I think there's some inherent power in that and that it becomes contagious and exponential. And so, uh, I firmly believe that 
having hope is not just a gift. Like you talk about Sally, where it's a gift that we give, or it's a gift that we have innately genetically, or however we want to talk about that. It's not just a gift, but it's a skill. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And And, and and I, sorry, I didn't mean it as a gift. And as you were speaking about your match analogy there, which I just loved what the way I'm thinking of that gift is you're going with your match to somebody that has no match. And that's what I mean. And by your match that's just glowing or glimmering is that you are able to empower that person in a way, just the tiniest bit at the time. So it's not like you can just hand it over a package. No. It's just that you can invite them in and allow this whole culture to support them with mm-hmm. this culture, which allows that. Yeah. I, I love the glowing match. I will be thinking about that. <laughs> and, and so uh, I think it's, I think it's a gift. I think some people have that gift in, in the in inherent in them, but I also am convinced that it's a skill and that uh, we can begin looking for the positive things around us. Uh, it, for some, it may take more work than others, but I really think it's a skill that we can build. And for those, for those that have that ability to see the hope in almost every situation, you still have a responsibility to grow in the facilitation of that and how you bring your match into a room. Uh, and, and that you're careful, not just to set everything on fire because it's fun to watch things burn. <laughs> yeah. Right? Um, we have to be careful with that. There's a stewardship, I think, that comes with this idea of hope um, because we yeah. live in a fragile society and we don't want to set up false hope. We don't want to give mm-hmm. uh, false outcomes. Uh, and in fact, if, if I can come into a room and, and through whatever I'm doing in there, if, if I can create an environment where that person's match gets brighter or it gets lit, I'm, I firmly believe that that might, that match too will never go out. It may dim, um, but it will never go out. And so it now becomes incumbent upon me to help them steward that for a period of time and, and mm-hmm. learn the power and, and the, if I can use the term, the power and the pleasure of having that in your life. Uh, but also walking away, knowing that your hope builds courage, not just in yourself, mm-hmm. but in other people. Mm-hmm. And sometimes it's not my place to be the one who builds the courage for those in the room. Sometimes it's my place to like, for I'll use my, my match again to bring my match into the room and just set it on the table and just let it be there. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. and, and allow that to build courage in others, uh, to find what is hope for them. Where do they see hope? Because there's very Mm -hmm. truly very few people who see no hope. Right. What, what I've, what I've experienced is, and maybe you can collaborate this, but what I've experienced is, is that they get, people get stomped on a lot. Yeah. Right. And, and they try new things and either their, their peers stomp on them or they get stomped on by, you know, their bosses or, you know, other departments or, you know, maybe even other institutions. Um, and, and that, that can wear a person down over time. Right. Mm-hmm. To the point where the candle hasn't gone out, but they're not, they're not willing to, to let it shine because there's there for them. There's no, there's no point because they've, they've just mm-hmm. seen this happen time and time again, but it, it helps, I think, to build courage, to be the one who puts it on the table and just lets it sit there. It's okay. like trust, right? Uh, we build trust by trusting others uh, appropriately. And uh, I think uh, with a degree of dis- discernment, uh, but we can't expect others to trust us if we're not willing to trust them. Right. And, and I I think there's some real power in that. Finally, (laughs) this has been a long monologue, but finally, I I really think that, that, that this hope infuses action, that it's not just an, an ethereal cerebral dream state that we're in. Uh, that we're just walking around and, you know, the campus could be burning down to the ground and we're just, you know, eating our popcorn and thinking, well, you know what, it's okay. Cause look at all the jobs will be created later. <laughs> right. We're not, yeah. we're not, we're not doing that. Um, we're, we're looking at what, what can, what can be done differently. 
right? Mm-hmm. And and usually when we get called into situations, it's it's because there's some triage that needs to happen, right? And um, I know when I, when I when I think of that metaphor, I, I don't go to the doctor f- for any other reason but to know what the problem is and how I can fix it, right? And so. When I, when I step into a triage situation, there are some things that will be dealt with at a higher priority than others, but everything will get dealt with. Uh, and some things are obvious and some things take time to figure out, but that's, I mm-hmm. think, where I'll, I'll stop my monologue for now. The word invite comes to mind as you're talking through that, Tim, that sort of, you know, and I think that's what we're doing is inviting I think what appreciative inquiry does is invites people into this space and then through the opportunities that are created there in the space Mm -hmm. is that it values them in a way that builds that, that, that shift in their mind that is, is hopeful. And, And I agree totally that, Lots, you know, we've all experienced being stamped on and sometimes by people that you trust really well. And it's hard to, you know, to bounce back from those things. Mm-hmm. And sometimes you can bounce just fine, like a squash ball. And then other times you're going to bounce just like one of those Christmas, you know, glass balls and sort of things. You're just not going to bounce back. Um, and so I think for many of the scenarios that, um, the authors used in the book that there are those joining these sessions not because they've chosen to, they haven't wanted to yeah. be there, but when they're there, the environment that's being created isn't so much about, you know, the the facilitator per se. It's not what the whether the facilitator is bringing hope. What they're doing is inviting hope out of you isn't it they're creating that environment and i just love that the for me i just think about the opportunities to really reflect back on what we're reading now and Mm -hmm. actually think of those times when yes this this is this opportunity to invite this person to give them that space and, and and allow them to feel that they're being valued yeah and it makes you think like I want to gift this book to this person this person (laughs) 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 with the chapter um, dog-eared and yeah yeah, exactly start there go straight to this page yeah go straight (laughs) to this um but um I, I I took took some notes down when you were talking of you know some of the combined with some of the notes that I took from the book and uh, what you know, what you were mentioning, Tim, regarding hope. Um, you know, they say in the book that hope doesn't need to be huge, mm-hmm. and um, and so it doesn't need to be this big idea or this like you know rainbow situation. It could just be, you know, I'm I'm hopeful for this to work. I need I want this to work. I, you know, I'm passionate about this, and I don't know what it is yet. I don't know what that that slice of hope is but I'm I want to be in this room today because I, I want to help get there and it's and it's you know what Sally alluded to it's the people that are put there that don't really want to get there and they can just kind of slow the process down mm-hmm. um and then you know with the I think with you know looking at an appreciative inquiry and what it is um and with the with, with the match um, metaphor I think you know the whole point of appreciative inquiry is that we don't necessarily have to be the one that goes in and lighten the match like you alluded to somebody in that room, you, you want them all to come with a match. It might be burning fiercely or it might just have a slight glow. Um, but you kind of, you kind of all want to, you know, have that energy in the room and all want to kind of get there. And I think we've all been in that situation. That's what's really difficult um, is when you go into a room and no one even brought a match, no one even cares to, strike the match, you know, and, and you've, you put so much of your energy and y- your hope and aspirations into something and nobody you know, or a small margin of people want to, want to get there with you. And, you know, like Sally said, and you said as well, Tim, we've all been in that situation where we've just, um, it's, it's, it's hard to keep lighting everyone's match. 
And, and it's hard to keep giving that energy out all the time when you don't feel it's being reciprocated back to you. And, um, and when you talk about, you know, um, people that are optimists and pessimists and introverts and extroverts and, and, and the way in which we use our energy, um, sometimes, you know, you feel that when you are trying to grow a room or grow an idea or find hope or grow hope, it, it, it can be very hard if you're not all on the same page. I think that's one of the first things that you need to strike is if, you know, if you, if you don't, didn't come here, you know, on your own accord, or you don't feel like you, you can contribute today because we've all had days where we just, we just, we just don't, we just don't glow and we just need to step away for a minute and then come back with the glow. And, um, and so, you know, or we might just want to sit there and listen and hope that someone will, you know, strike a light inside of us because we just kind of needed that energy because we can get really defeated. And I, I've been through some, you know, dark times where I feel like fully defeated and the people that I trust haven't, you know, supported um, supported me in a way that I like to. And, and, but I think through learning that has made me very, um, kind of open-minded and, and very, um, in tune when this is happening to other people. Yeah. And even when you feel like I need to say this, even though it's very petty, but I, or very small, I need to say this person did this really well. And right. this, you know, and lifting other people up because it's not there. And, um, I, did um i did just talk yeah i just noted noted down the culture as well because you can have three three or four different mandates there you could have the culture you can have a vision this it can be very complicated and we're not saying that oh we're all hopeful and magical and wonderful and but we we have to be on the same track and we've talked about this before in some other pod- podcasts about sometimes we need to when we're looking for the joy we need to, we need to kind of organize. We need to, you know, we need to, you know, set a playing field. So when we talk about, you know, we need to Marie Kondo a, a department, (laughs) you know, we need to thank it for its time and thank it for the joy that it's given us and put it away and find something that's going to now provide us with joy, not just always looking back at the history uh, of what's been created. Um, and, uh, yeah, so, hope doesn't need to be huge it just needs to be there yeah no, you're right whatever so, form it is you're right and as you're talking it reminds me of um john cotter's change model his eight step change model mm-hmm. and uh you know the, the first three steps are so crucial and and i love the order of them and john, john's model works i've used it in a bunch of different areas and it and it works um and that first one in in creating urgency or grabbing on to urgency uh, and then the second one is, is building the right team. And sometimes you don't get a choice in who's on the team. So you just, you inherit a group of people or you walk into a situation and this is the group of people that you're working <laughs> with. But, but I love the fact that that comes before anything else. So the next two steps are, uh, creating the vision. And then the fourth one is communicate. So communicate clearly. And so I love the fact that we, we build the team first and it's not just about building in the sense of, you know, having people come on a committee or you have a department to work with. It's more than that. It's beginning to work out. Okay. So what are, what are the things that, that we're going to agree to that we can, that that we will behave around? So the norms of the team, how are we going to behave with one another? How are we going to express certain things to one another? Um, what are we going to do with conflict? Or is it okay to disagree here? Um, is it when we disagree, what's that look like? And, and in essence, we're almost working out, you know, if I was to give it a title, we're fleshing out some kind of team charter that everyone's going to agree to that. We're going to, we're going to work this process around this, this, uh, this document that we create to help govern the process. And I think those first two steps are so crucial. Like identifying the urgency and then getting the team on board and getting them used to working together before you build the vision. Right. And appreciative inquiry has taught me that I don't come with the vision. I let the vision emerge. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and even if it's in a department that I'm, you know, I'm, I'm a part of, or I'm leading, 
uh, it's, it's, it's probably easier to bring some ideas of a vision into that space because uh, it may even be expected from other people in the room that, hey, Tim Carson's the one who's supposed to bring the ideas here. Okay, uh, but I'm willing to let them die on the floor for other ones. But when I'm with other groups of people, it's not my vision. Mm-hmm. Can't be my vision, right? And so to allow that to emerge uh, after the team has had time to talk, dialogue, mm-hmm. maybe have a little scrap, <laughs> right? Uh, and then arrive at a point of saying, okay, that's where we want to go. Right. That's, that's what we want this thing to look like because you begin building our, you begin building this inward momentum with that group that's external to you. Right. And that's what I think I really want is I want to be able to mm-hmm. see a team or a group or a department come to a point where they don't need Tim Carson anymore. They know where mm-hmm. they're going. They, they know how to They know the steps and how to get there. And, you know, they can do this on their own. Uh, I'm there to help, but I'm not there. I'm not there to lead. I'm there to help. Um, And and so in talking about hope and, and how it plays out and what we do, I really, I really love the connection between what we're talking about in this chapter with John Carter's uh, Mm -hmm. first three steps and his change model. Um, Cause it reminds me that not every, not every time we come into a situation, it, what did I write down here? It's, it's not an event, but it's a process. And, and I keep telling myself that in a lot of different situations, this is not an event. It's a process. Mm-hmm. And uh, even in my design thinking uh, it's a process. I, we, we prototype, we test, we iterate, we prototype, we test, we iterate, and we find out what works. We, and, and we ask ourselves, can we iterate that into something better? And we find out what doesn't work and we go, okay, so why, why didn't it work? Was mm-hmm. it some, you know, on all those questions and you go, okay, so do we Marie Condio this and just jettison <laughs> it out the window? Right. Or do we iterate that into something different? Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. So I, I really love the, that part of the chapter. And yeah, I, when you were saying there, Tim, about these groups that come together, you know, that don't want to work together. Mm-hmm. And I think this is this is the value of appreciative inquiry. Now, I can't speak to Cotter's model now because that was quite a few years ago when I read that. But I know at that time I was reading Cotter, I was reading Patrick Lencioni and yeah. a few of the others. And it was very much about getting the right people on board the bus. And, mm-hmm. and that term was there a lot about having the right people coming together, people bringing in all this energy and everything else. And what I see is with appreciative inquiry, it is this recognition that if unless you've chosen to work together like we, you know, we have mm-hmm. and we mm-hmm. choose to work on initiatives together um, in most situations, people are there. They they haven't chosen that. And yep. these are the teams. What appreciative inquiry um, gives me hope in is the fact that heading into those situations now is that within those groups that don't want to work together, they're not the right people on the bus. Mm -hmm. But by actually, you know, going, supporting them, inviting them to think and creating this environment where it does spark hope in the individuals that it may take a long time but Mm -hmm. i have faith that that could happen and i'm not totally sure that i did have that before and because Mm -hmm. i've worked in so many of those circles and they just they are exhausting and and exhausting because i think that maybe i had always tried with my energy and my hope Mm -hmm. to you know to lead and that's the piece for me here Mm -hmm. and i've just got one little quote out of the book that they the authors talk about you know ai in highly complex environments where realities are tough hope does not deny that reality it opens their eyes to possibilities never considered or seen and i think in those those groups those difficult situations where we're most needed where ai is most needed but if we can invite those members in a way that they can actually consider or see things slightly differently then then that would be 
that would bring lots of magic to um mm -hmm. for me <laughs> mm -hmm. well that you know we should we should let lucy talk about magic she's been yep. trying to dive in there and i think yeah. it's like the perfect segue of what environment that that magic does occur in yeah i um i'm going to go back to my other notes here but i have um i wanted to um, just dash back to um when you talked about triage tim because i just made a note and Sometimes I think what we're looking at is appreciative inquiry being, um, you know, we are, you know, you are in that triage moment and now you're, you, you kind of have to go into this deliberate situation where now you have to make something great <laughs> that is not great. That's messy. And, um, and that's the difference between your trade and my trade. So your trade is people don't call you to, you know, normally for preventative maintenance, only like awesome people do that. Like, my husband he's like preventative maintenance guy like you know like people that are you know we want to do this so this doesn't happen so the engine doesn't explode or whatever but not a lot of people not high percentage people are like that they they're the triage people whereas for me um being from you know my area holistic therapy skin and body therapies it's about preventative um and maintaining a constant so that you don't fall into this triage and uh, that's why i found like my sister's a hairdresser um, I'm I'm in the holistic therapies and they're very different people, <laughs> you know, a lot of the time, um, and uh, and they bring different personalities. So maybe looking at AI being something that we talked about this as being part of a culture, but um, you know when you do have your you know your regular faculty meetings, you know you, you have to have to continue with this same practice of you know looking at the hope, looking at you know, what's been happening, the complexity within the department, and then continuing on with that vision. You can't be like all of a sudden one day, I mean, we talked about this in the last pod podcast, but you can't all of a sudden one day be like, okay, we're now in triage and we have to sort this out because it, it just doesn't come off. You know, it does, it just doesn't come off, you know, to people. And, and, um, and so I think that trying to build it into a culture and it takes a long time to shift a culture, like, a long time it's and um you know if somebody told me that 12 years ago i'd be like oh surely not but it takes about 12 years. <laughs> yeah. no it takes it takes a long time to shift to shift the culture and um and i think that you know going into the to the room and and asking people you know like why why did you come today why did you come to this monthly faculty meeting why did you come to this curriculum development meeting you know you know why did you come to this uh this strategic planning meeting and and trying to find out because everyone's level of hope and everyone's idea of hope is very different it means different things and, uh, and our job as facilitators is to guide us onto the same pitch you know when we were talking about curriculum development and we were kind of talking about this um pre-podcast today but when we're looking at balancing curriculum development are we looking at you know yeah, we're going to make this amazing, magical, incredible curriculum, or are we aligning it with the academic timetable? Are we aligning it with the schedule of the shop and the, 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 the labs? Are we aligning it with instructors that have taught a certain way, come from a different institution, have a different idea about, you know, what are we aligning it with? And we all have different ideas of what that hope is and how aligning it. And I think that's how it can get, um, you know, get very complex, but Going back to the magic, <laughs> which, which I know, you know, and I know in the Canadian post-secondary system, it's not always magical and sparkly, um, but it kind of has to be or else, you know, and I know, I know some colleagues of mine are going to be probably listening to this and being like, oh yeah, you know, but having, having a grandiose idea, you know, it, it isn't a bad thing. And, and, you know, saying that we can do this, you know, we can, we can actually get this done. We can create something magical. We can make a shift. We can transform. We can do something we've never done before. And, you know, it, it can be done, you know, it, it can happen. And so that's why, like, I was like, Oh, I love this chapter because, um, you know, being a, being a facilitator, like, I don't know if I could bring you know, a magic wand to a heavy mechanical trade strategic planning session. If anybody could, that. you could. Yeah. Actually, you know what? They'd probably allow it. They'd probably <laughs> just let me get on with it. Let's do it, Lucy. Um, but, um, 
but you know, I've been in a talking stick circle before and that was pretty powerful, um, with, um, with an indigenous group, um, uh, facilitators that we kind of all met together, um, in, um, in the interior very early on when I moved to Canada and, um, and there's, there's ways, I mean, you know, this match, I mean, this, this match that you've been alluding to, Tim, could be your your magic wand. It's a way in which you can you can give people the power for a minute and uh, and let them contribute to something that could be pretty pretty you know incredible. And and sometimes when we're facilitating um, you know different types of conversations and we're trying to you know have positive dialogue and constructive dialogue. Um, you know, we need something like a magic wand or we need, we need to make sure that we, that we will believe in a little bit of, of magic or else, you know, we're never going to, we're never going to meet our dreams or our goals. And we all have, we all must have dreams. Like you said, Tim, life isn't hopeless. (laughs) Um, you know, sometimes, (laughs) sometimes it is. It may seem like that, but it's not really like that, but, but there, there's a shred of something in it and, and sit, and I don't know if you've ever, you know, you've ever seen a talking, um, talking stick before or you, yeah. And it, you know, and just allowing everybody to, uh, you know, a moment to, to speak because, because rooms can be taken over by, by, um, the, the people that like to speak and the people that have ideas or need a minute to contribute, you know, they don't, they don't sometimes get a minute and, and it doesn't have to be rushed. Um, as long as they're holding this stick, they can sit and think, and then they can they can talk or they can give it away and then ask for it back later on and it just allows for that dialogue you know to um to keep to keep happening and um yeah i had i had another train of thought but i'm going to bring that back in a minute because okay let me i wanted i wanted to idea yeah yeah, (laughs) give me your ideas on your uh your magic route yeah, transformative powers. <laughs> and, and I know Tim, Tim's got to speak about this, but I too struggled with this term magic. And because it's just, it doesn't, you know, it doesn't sit comfortably with me. I'm a little bit too practical for that kind of thing. But I really reading through this, reading through this chapter a couple of times, I really got to understand by what they meant by this. And it is, it's something that you can't give people. It's something that you cannot force to happen. It is through the environment that has been created, whether you want the people to collaborate, whether you want them to connect and imagine together, become creative and energized together. It's not about what you want. It's about creating this environment and the environment and and you know the suggestions that the authors use as they they create this environment that then the people within the group come together and collaborate they connect they they imagine they're creative they're energized and that transformation happens and so as you were talking just a minute ago about you know um department chairs in these roles and things like that i'm thinking that one of the how useful this would be to actually you know to offer appreciative inquiry as as a way of supporting our, uh you know our colleagues that are in leadership roles that i know for myself when i went into when i became a department chair i'd been teaching for all of i don't know i think i'd been an auxiliary for about 5 years and just became a regular instructor and straight in there as chair and 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 so i did my best but if somebody had actually showed me a different model a model such mm-hmm. as this and and because it is a philosophy and you know brings us full circle but tim mm-hmm. i so want you to talk about the whole piece that you and I both struggled with today when we were trying to find a different term to use the magic. And I have to say, I, I, I really could not come up with another term. So I am yeah. over to you, sir. So the, the term for all of you who are listening to this amazing conversation, the term is magic wand. 
And uh, as I'm reading through the chapter, I'm like, there's. I can't no- wait to hear the music that you play with this podcast. Uh, yeah. I yeah. just can't wait. Yeah, there's a, yeah, yeah, there's, there's, there's no way I can walk into a room of TVET faculty members with a feather duster. That, that's just not going to work. And, and there's no way I could even use the term magic wand with any degree of I integrity I, or I have a slice of hope. I do. <laughs> well, I, you know, I'm not afraid to use that language actually. And I, and I've used that before where I, I've, I've chatted with people in, in TVET and they go, you know, I, that's not going to work. We've tried that and it's not, you know, it doesn't work. And I'm like, well, how long ago did you try that? Oh, a decade ago. Well, don't you think things have changed in a decade? Maybe just a tiny bit, like people come and go, right? Like maybe even your, your perspective has changed in 10 years. So, and, and somebody said, well, you, you sure keep having all this hope. And I'm like, that, that's sometimes that's the only thing we got. Yeah. Right. Sometimes that's the only thing we, that's the only thing freaking thing we got. Right. Yeah. And, 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 and I turn it back and say, you know, you've got hope in your students every day. You, you, not just this frilly dilly yeah. hope that, Oh, I hope they're going to pass. No. See, for me, <laughs> hope is hope is a level of confidence. Right. Um, and sometimes that confidence is in my ability. Sometimes that confidence is in other people's ability. Sometimes the confidence is in knowing that an answer will show up right. Or a solution will emerge or Mm -hmm. we will get through this. And it's, and it's not just, you know, pie in the sky, airy fairy magic wand stuff. It's, I have a deep conviction of these things and, and it's Mm -hmm. what drives me. So when I'm reading through and I'm coming across, you know, the story of the magic wand and I'm like, you know, that's awesome in the humanities, but that's, that's not going to fly in, in a, in a room full of pipe fitters and steam fitters. Like they're just, they're just going to walk out. Right. That's just not going to work. Um, so I, I tried to, I tried to come up with, with a, with a different term or a different word. And, and really I, I haven't yet other than story, my story, everyone has a story. Mm-hmm. Everyone mm-hmm. in that room has a story and allowing them and this is going to sound weird saying it's this way, but I'm just going to say it this way, allowing them the space to express some of the emotion that they feel, right? Whether that's love, whether that's grief, whether that's joy, most of it's going to be frustration. Um, but as an, as an AI practitioner, uh, it's, it's, it's part of my, a part of my stewardship in that, in that space to allow them the, the opportunity to express that. And sometimes that means encouraging. Sometimes that means defending and protecting one person. Cause so, you know, there's, like you said, there's some persons who don't want to share or they, it takes a long time for them to share what they want to share. And I really want to protect that. And I want to make sure that when somebody has shared something that it doesn't get stomped on, that it doesn't get devalued, that it doesn't get dismissed because it's important. It's important to them. And it was important enough to say out loud in a group. Uh, And um, so, you know, coming up with it with a different term term for the magic wand, I, I, I haven't come up with one other than just the power of story. And, Mm -hmm. and I know that. I don't have. Oh, sorry. I know that I know that there are certain times when I'm in the class, whether it's with uh, apprentices or school of business uh, students, whether they're, you know, 21, 51, I know that there are certain stories that I share of turning points in my life that are super significant um, that captures their attention so much that it makes them think of their own story. And, and why they're there and why they're doing what they're doing. Like, you know, when you're an apprentice and you're, you're on EI and you're in school and you've got your wife at home and two little ones, right? Like everything depends on you, not only to finish school, but to do it well. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, And, you know, we've got apprentices in our classroom who've been laid off. Like there's no job to go back to. Right. And yet we expect them to sit in a classroom for six to eight weeks and focus on that math for crying out loud, because, Mm -hmm. you know, math is important. Well, is it as important as finding another job when you're done? Mm -hmm. You know, um, so allowing, allowing the space to have 
um, our students and our, and our faculty peers share their story takes time, takes trust, but it's powerful. Right. Mm -hmm. And yeah. So I don't have another word for magic wand other than just story. Mm -hmm. I, I don't have another word for magic wand, but the magic that takes place within the AI environment that is this, this buzz, this synergy that takes place when this environment has been created. And without our lead as without our direct influence, those participants come together and, you know, that flame is glowing strong. And so to me, as you were talking through that, Tim, I don't have another name for the magic one, but for me, that real, we've, we've been there. We've been members of those teams, you know, in our master's programs, when you get to work with a group and the, you yeah. all really get it and it happens. I think, so as you were saying that I was thinking of a buzz, it's a real buzz and it's a synergy. And I think for me, it's, they're the terms that really capture what it is. The authors are, are talking about that. If this all, they don't make it happen because they actually say, does that always happen? And no, it really is one of those things mm -hmm. that they can't, they can't control. And I think that's the beauty of it, right? Because if you can control it, then it becomes manipulative. And you know, that that's always been the big mm -hmm. knock against charismatic leadership styles is that it just mm -hmm. becomes too manipulative and becomes too mm -hmm. self-centered, self-focused. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, but when you look at the, when you look at the, the styles of leadership, like transformational leadership and servant leadership and authentic leadership, it's, it's, there's just something different entirely. Right. Mm -hmm. And, and you're right. Like people can smell that stuff a mile away. Mm -hmm. And, you know, let's be honest, there, there have been times where we've all done that to a certain degree where we come in and we go, I got the answer. I know what you need to do. Just shut up and listen and do what I tell you to do. And this will all be over. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But we also know that that doesn't work. Mm -hmm. No, it, right? doesn't. it doesn't work. Like, you know, you walk into a group of people that, you know, they're the top in their industry. Right. They're, and they've built businesses. I mean, they, they've hired, they fired, they've, they've been through highs and lows. They've been through all that stuff. And now they're, now they're a faculty and, and not, not now that there's, there's 20 of them in the room instead of just one, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, you've got 20, a type top dog people in the room and you're trying to herd them in a general direction. And, you know, Lucy, mm -hmm. you said it best. Like the last thing you want to mm -hmm. do is walk into that room and tell them what you think they should do because they're just yeah. going to look at you and go, okay, I'm done walking yeah. out. Right? And, and that's sometimes too, when you, you know, you do lose the magic because you do have a lot of these you know, ideas and thoughts and you're not, you don't, you're not allowed to explore them. You're, you know, you have to kind of just uh, hush up and continue on. And I think that's the difference. Like what we talked about when you feel that, that kind of magic happen is, sure. um, you know, like when you've worked, when you've really accomplished something uh, within, especially when it's in your team that, you know, mm -hmm. you know, the team that you, um, and you all can walk away and, and think, wow, like we really, got through some stuff today and we're all kind of now kind of in the right direction. Like I think we're going, but, but I mean, but you have, you have the type of leaders, you know, if we're talking about when you're a department head or a department chair, and we do have the type of leaders that really push to find the magic and those that mm -hmm. just, they don't want to pursue it because they're, they're afraid of, um, you know, what might happen if they hope, you know, mm -hmm. If, if they just continue with the behavior, if they just continue with this culture and don't interrupt it, then they can just keep their head down and get their work done, you know? And, and I know people may think that finding the magic, creating the magic, allowing space for, for a group to make magic in a room, you know, it sounds a bit lighty da, but it's bloody hard work. Yep. It's really hard work to do that. Yep. And to, you know, especially if you're in an environment where you really, it needs to fix or it's going to completely implode um, to find the good and, you know, encourage everyone, like share, share your ideas, share your thoughts, like let's do this, you know, let's create something and allow everyone to put a log on this fire and build something that is mm -hmm. 
you know, you know, really great and roaring and full of energy, you know, that's what you can do. And it's, it's way easier not to do that. It's way easier not to, you know, inquire, <laughs> you know, it's, um, if you could just kind of plod along and continue on and don't want to get your hands dirty and, you know, and, and don't hear, you know, I, you know, don't, don't want to be a trail trailblazer. You just want to continue down that path. It's easy to do that. And so when people think, Oh, the big idea person, Oh yeah. You know, they have ideas, they have so much hope and they have, they believe that we can create this magic. That's, that's not an easy task to do. And, you know, we talk about, you know, magic wand and, you know, we laughed about it and, but we all used to believe in magic wands. You know, we used to believe in the tooth fairy and, and I hope there's no children listening. Um, I, hope my, I hope my children are in bed. Um, but, but, and Father Christmas. <laughs> and, um, you know, so we had that belief and, um, and it, it's still there. It's just in different forms now. It's you just know, in different, different ways. Yeah. You know what I'm really interested in? And, I, and maybe I just didn't take this from the book. When the um, authors have, you know, they've facilitated um, AI in many different levels and have done so for many, many years. Um, I w- do they ever mention the term hope or the term magic? And I know that the the magic and the the skit came through from, or you know, has been carried forward. But my sense is that they don't. They this is their analysis of. AI. And, and I'm just so curious. And I do hope that we get to uh, ask Joan and Jeannie that question one day. <laughs> yeah. Maybe you we know, can invite them to the finale. That would be great. Finale podcast. Yeah. Um, I, I think to, I'm, I'm not afraid to use the word hope in, in certain contexts, right? Um, I may not use it in all contexts. It, it, it will certainly depend on the room and, and, and that will come with time. Right. So, uh, meaning if it's not, if it's not my department or it's not a group I'm closely associated with, I hope I have a good chunk of time with them to get to that point. But I think to the beauty of it is like I mentioned before, is that, um, the match doesn't, doesn't only come in and, 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 uh, metaphorically talk about how I have hope when I bring, when I come into different situations, it's also an opportunity to shed light on different areas where, you know, as, as a new person to that experience or a new person to that situation, I don't have the biases. I don't have the background. I don't, I, I, I can sometimes have a bit more courage to say, okay, so why did this happen like that? And, and, or why, why does this group feel this way? Um, and I've had some people say to me, well, you know, you wouldn't understand if we told you, and I, well, try me. I may not, but in, in doing that, I'm encouraging them to share the story, right? And then once they share the story, that now cracks the door for others to add on or to add pieces that, you know, may not have been added before. And sure enough, given enough time, that becomes the cohesion for the group to move into a station of hope where I can say something along the lines of, all right, so we've, we've had an opportunity to talk about all this stuff. Where do you want to go from here? What, what does the future look like for you? Um, And sometimes people say, well, I don't know. Okay. Well, let's look at what we've talked about and let's see if there's some themes and pick it out. Right. I, I, I really came into, into a state of um, appreciative is the wrong, probably the, the, the monotonous term. Now I've come to, to deeply love appreciative inquiry because we did it in our master's degree, like every pick and thing Mm -hmm. that we did at first, it was appreciative inquiry. And and at first I'm like, give me a break. Like, this is dumb. Mm -hmm. Shut up. (laughs) I've had enough. And this is day two. Right. Um, but uh, it was embedded in everything that we did. In fact, it was, it was embedded right into our thesis and our final project that it was part of our methodology. Um, and I love it. I'll, I'll never give it up. Like it's always going to be a part of what I do um, because of 
the hope issue, but also the magic too. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and I'll use that term to describe this is that when things start clicking and they start coming together and you know, it's not because of you, you know, it's because they've gelled, they've had a breakthrough or they've had a walkthrough. Like I won't call it a breakthrough, but they've had a walkthrough where Mm -hmm. It's like, okay, the door's open now and we can see into the room as before the door was locked and all we had was this tiny little window to look in, but now the door's open. We can go in if we want to know that that happened without me unlocking the door, but they did it themselves. That's Mm -hmm. magic for me Mm -hmm. because that, that is absolute magic for me because I know that that from that point on, they really don't need me anymore Mm -hmm. and that's good. And this is going to sound weird, but it's almost like being a parent for me. Totally. Right. right? Totally. Where I've, I've, I've had, I've had this little person in my life now for 20 plus years. Uh, and I've done everything that I can to teach them and instill in them and, and raise them up to be this kind of person. But there comes a point where they have to walk through the door and when they unlock it and they walk through, that's awesome. I'm still there. You can still give me a call. I'm here to help. I'm here to do whatever I want. And Lucy, this reminds me of your dad, right? When he's Mm -hmm. telling you, just do it, just go for it. You'll regret Mm -hmm. it if you don't. And who cares if it fails, you can always come home where this is good, right? That's, that's what I want people to experience when, 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 when we run into AI and we bring it into the space that we're working in is, and, and I love it because I don't have to have all the answers. Yeah. Right. And that's why when you said like, you know, it's not about a path, Mm -hmm. you know, it's exploring different paths and figuring out, you know, really what works. And, Mm -hmm. and I, you know, I think the the struggle that we have to get over first is the hump is for like, let's say for working within faculty, within a team in higher education is for them to understand that they, that they can make a difference, that they can put ideas forward. Mm -hmm. Like a lot of the time when, you know, we go into these discussions like, well, we have to do it this way. Like you don't actually, it's yeah. been done that way. Yeah. It doesn't mean you have to continue to do it that way. And I don't yeah. think, I don't think faculty members often get given the opportunity mm-hmm. um, to actually sh- explore, like, you know, let's just out of the box here. If you could do anything you wanted to do, if you could take this anywhere, where would you take it? Yeah. And also, you know, when you, you know, facilitating these types of uh, workshop is, you know, and we've talked about, delivering education and backwards design and bikerness delivery we kind of need to do that in this realm as well we need to give people the opportunity to think about what they're going to what type of room they're going to be stepping into you know and not just showing them saying okay so we're going to talk about this what ideas do you have because they're going to look at you just as your students look at you when you present a new concept to them like a deer at headlights like uh i I need to think about this like i and and there are going to be the people that are going to just spread ideas and there are going to be people that need to come and need to have time to critically think through what do I want? You know, I'm given this opportunity now to, so making sure even the, 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 the lead up to these types of discussions and your meetings, like making sure that you're preparing the group when they come in, you know, so that they feel that they have tools to, that they, they, that they, that they're told bring a match, you know, mm-hmm. not just show up and you know, create one, like let them know <laughs> they need to come with, you know, they need to come with some tools, they need to come with some ideas, they need to come sure. with an open mind or whatever it is that you're working through. And um, because if you just kind of, we've got an, you know, a two hour session or we've got like, you know, and we have to fit it into this box um, you know, and, and not giving people the opportunity to, really think about what they want and the direction that they want to go in or the fears or the hopes or the dreams that they have. And, um, you know, and working through those, those things together, because otherwise you'll just hear half of them and then, you know, it won't continue on. But I, I think that especially now we need to think of, because we're at that tipping point now where we're starting to look at returning to campus, what that's going to look like, you know, what, what is our destiny going to be? How are we going to, how are we going to create the magic in order to, you know, survive and be hopeful and, 
deliver programs that are flexible for people that are full of abundance, that are creative, that are different, that are not just, you know, the same thing. How can we now pivot to what we want our programs to be like in, in 10 and 20 and 50 years time? Are we still going to be here in 50 years time if we don't continue? Yeah. That is like, I'll be, uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. no, me. I'll be on a beach. No. Yeah. I'll be waiting on for that big, storm. I'll be on the big beach. Yeah, but, you know, like, I mean, meaning us, I mean, will post secondary institutions survive in 50 years? Because I think that we need to be, you know, we need to be delivering education 24 seven. We need to be fully available. It's not, people aren't the nine to fives anymore. They, that does not exist. It doesn't exist in my life. I don't know if it exists in your life, but you know, it's, it's this, like, I, I read my book when I get a minute, I listen to my podcast when I get a minute, when I'm able to fit the, when I want to learn, when I feel open to learning in my day. And so, you know, I think we're at this time now that we really need to look at, we need to look at the magic and kind of some of the, some of the magic that's been happening and that now we need to capture in a little box and figure out what we want to do with it and how we want to direct it, you know? So, yeah, I don't, I, I yeah, I, I, I don't know if I could pull off, I don't know if I could even pull off a, ma- a magic wand <laughs> or a feather duster, <laughs> you know? But in, you know what? Next week's uh, next chapter. No, I don't know whether it will be next week. Is the critical lens of transformative education? Yep. I yep. cannot wait to get into that chapter. Yep. Like, yeah, I, yeah, I've carved out some time already to kind of really get into that, and and uh, I'm I'm looking forward to you know seeing the perspective of you know, that transformative aspect that may be a new lens that I haven't heard because transformative um, education or learning or the the term transform, it's, it's thrown around a lot and, um, and and it's become a bit more common um, now, like, you know, um, the transformative approach to this or that. And I'm really looking forward to seeing how this connects to, um, you know, kind of structure in an appreciative inquiry approach to facilitating um, and looking into you know higher education and how you can really set the mind for it to transform. I think Absolutely. that's the yeah. Absolutely. So as we draw to a close, ladies and gentlemen, um, yeah, next next session will be uh, even better than this one because it, it does talk about the critical lens on appreciative inquiry, but some praxis points for us to think about until we get into that next uh, podcast is hope is a powerful tool for agility. Hope is a powerful tool for agility. Hope is a mindset. Hope is also okay. a practice. Uh hope and magic are transformative in nature. Uh, And then one question that uh, we would leave you, our listener with, is how do you approach your work with hope and magic? So ladies, until next time. Mm -hmm. Good question. Awesome. Good question.